So close, but so far. Hello there, guys. What is going on? Daniel Charles back here again for my rational perspective on Chelsea 2, Arsenal 2, the game that took place last night at a absolutely drenched Stamford Bridge. Um... I've waited a little bit to do this review because uh, I got back quite late last night from Stamford Bridge and my voice was a little bit uh, strained. It still is kind of now, but a little bit better than it was last night because sort of shouting at Stamford Bridge, I mean, it kind of and and, and cheering and, and getting emotional and stuff. So I wanted to also give some time to recover and, and sort of think about the game a little bit more, look at some of the analysis. I was on that Chelsea pod. Please go and check it out. We sort of dissected the game. It, it really is frustrating and I said before the game I thought it was going to be a score draw but then football has a very cruel way of turning that prediction against you because I, I think most people would have taken that before the game given the level of opponent but because of the way it played out it feels like a defeat it doesn't feel like a, a good point or a, a well contested draw and it's very hard to be objective and look at the long term because there are more positives than negatives that's undeniable Chelsea are going in a very positive direction under Mauricio Pochettino. I still firmly believe that and I don't know how you could come to a different conclusion. But when you have that calamitous mistake from Robert Sanchez, when you have a, a sense of implosion so late in the game where things have been going so well, it, it it's very hard to come away from that game feeling that it's a point gained rather than two points lost. But I'm going to try my best to be objective, try my best to look at the positives as I like to do on this show. And we will start with the bad because I want to get the bad out of the way first. I want to give my criticisms and then we'll get to the good because I think there is much more to speak about from a positive and try and lift people's spirits rather than sort of end the show on a real downer. We'll start with the bad um, and obviously Robert Sanchez. Um, I just... It, I think it's disingenuous to come at this with one error out of nowhere because Sanchez has this in him. We saw it against Brighton, most notably, where he literally passed the ball out to Drao Pedro. Chelsea got away with it that night and we won the game. We didn't get away with it. And even if it was a brilliant finish from Declan Rice, very alert, brilliant right foot finish into the corner to get Arsenal back into the game, it just is inexcusable. And it's not a case of playing out from the back using your goalkeeper in build-up is a flawed strategy. That's kind of not the point here. It's about game state. It's about context. It's about certainty. And it's also about a trend of seeing Sanchez give the ball away in dangerous areas. If you're unsure, clear the ball. And it's not the case that we never look long with this goalkeeper and under Pochettino. That's just, that's just you know, that's not true. We did it consistently last night. There was, a, there was one moment where Robert Sanchez played one of the best passes I've seen from a goalkeeper in some time at Stamford Bridge to Malo Gusto. So he he does it. He has done it. And and to relieve pressure in that moment, it's, um, it's just really, really poor. Because at that moment in the game, Arsenal and their fans looked absolutely dead. I mean, the game looked absolutely done. There was very little. It looked almost like both teams had kind of agreed what the score was going to be and we were just going to play out the game till full time and maybe Chelsea could even get a third as they continued to create opportunities and looked more confident. And from that moment, the game turned. Arsenal were given more life, more energy. And I do think, apart from Sanchez, it was also maybe an exposing a lack of experience with this team, of not handling that moment very well, of being rocked by it, the crowd being rocked by it, and conceding again very quickly. Sure, it was a brilliant cross from Bakayo Saka, who Marco Carrera had done a brilliant job of nullifying for most of the game. But just, I think the lack of experience and the lack of know-how and game management in that moment was exposed by the rest of the team in that they were so shaken by that moment, it allowed the momentum to so drastically swing in Arsenal's favour to a point where even Eddie Nketiah was getting a chance shortly after the equaliser where it looked like Arsenal were the more likely team to win it. And I just think that's a real, real problem that Pochettino's going to have to analyse. I think the players have got to analyse but is it that shocking? We speak a lot about experience and we speak a lot about the, the youthful nature of this team, of understanding that there are going to be these massive highs probably, but also these massive lows. And that's why I continue to compare it to the 1920 team because we saw that in abundance from that team. I do think this team has more know-how and I think a better, tact a better tactician really at the helm in Mauricio Pochettino that I think will get Chelsea more points and, and get us further along that line rather than 
these kind of wild dips but it is just really frustrating you you just cannot allow that moment to happen you cannot be that close to such a important win a potential important win that would have lifted the mood to allow that that moment to slip it's not the case that Arsenal were on top of us for most of the game and you know if it had been one nil say and they'd got a equalizer and you would have said actually on the balance of play that's fair Chelsea were dominant they were better than Arsenal they had Arsenal's biggest threats nullified throughout the entirety of the game Arteta was having to to switch and look to his bench consistently to try and alter things. He was bringing on Smith Rowe, who hasn't played a lot of football this season. He, at half time, had to bring on Tommy Asu for Zinchenko because Zinchenko had been so horrified and sort of uh, tortured by Raheem Sterling. So, all round, it's just it's shooting yourself in the foot. And it's not the case that Robert Sanchez hasn't had these moments in him. It's just the fact that we were punished severely for it. And I don't think it's hyperbolic or silly to say without that moment I think the game just ends 2-0 I mean maybe Arsenal get a late consolation but I think Chelsea win the game and it's that game state it's that game management that simply is just hard to comprehend hard to excuse because it was such a wonderful performance that deserved three points and the fact that one individual mistake from you got when your goalkeeper's costing you points like that I mean it's the thing we always said about Kepa is that it's just you can't account for it you can't survive in a season doing it I mean it's just it's, it's really really hard to to work around that and to and to survive really when when a goalkeeper is is making those very basic scoreboard errors and it, it completely changed the game and changed changes the way a lot of us feel about this performance because the good and I think there is a lot of good is Chelsea competed not only competed but bettered Arsenal I think a lot of the analysis post this game will be about especially if you're an Arsenal fan you'll say and we all do this right we we look at our team first and um, I think a lot of the analysis from Arsenal fans will be like it's the worst Arsenal have played in in a long time you know Arsenal was so below par and, and Chelsea still couldn't beat them I think Arsenal were below par partly because of their own failings but also because Chelsea force them to make errors that they don't usually make it's because Chelsea were so alive so alert so well structured were able to move the ball in so precise and effective ways and I think that's because for 75 77 minutes for most of the game I think the the plan the structure of the team the profile of the team and the performances of the individuals involved in the team were wonderful it was one of the best Chelsea performances against this level of opponent we have seen for some time if you compare this Chelsea team to 2015 Chelsea, to 2017 Chelsea, to even as far back as 2005 Chelsea, you're probably going to be disappointed. But if you compare this Chelsea team to last year, if you compare this Chelsea team to even recent years, and when you factor in the players still to come into this team, the likes of Christopher Nkunku in the long term, but Reese James now returning from injury, I don't know how you're not encouraged by what we have in front of us right now. Because there are so many positive signs. I think that's the most irritating thing that they don't have the win and the point so far to kind of justify that. But I have to say, taking that emotion out of it, I am so encouraged that this team went against a very good Arsenal side that had some very good players and performed so well. And, and I think so many of those players deserve to be on the winning side if not for an individual mistake. I think the team was very interesting. You know, I didn't suspect that Cole Palmer would be playing as a number nine. We'll get to Cole Palmer because I think he his positioning was obviously very interesting throughout the game, how fluid it was and how much of an impact he played. But the rest of the team, Axel Dezassi, not ready for the game. It, it, it was mentioned by Pochettino in the pre-match press conference that he needed to be checked upon whether he was going to be ready for this game. He wasn't because he got a knock during the international break. But then we saw Levi Colwell playing at left centre-back for the first time this season. Mark Kukurea playing at left-back. That was a massive test for him. Malo Gusto playing instead of Reese James, who obviously not ready to start. The same midfield three, Casado, Gallagher, Fernandez, Mudrick and Sterling. We spoke about whether it was going to be either of them because we suspected that Nicholas Jackson would play. In the end, it was both of them playing and, of course, Cole Palmer up front. I think that the, the start to the game, the conditions were awful, but the start to the game I thought was brilliant from Chelsea. I thought from the off, they were just 
at Arsenal. I think it was very basic things, right? The conditions didn't make it a very slick game. And arguably that's what led to a lot of the errors within the game that we saw, even the ones that weren't punished. I mean, there was a moment in the first half where Levi Carwell gave the ball away straight to, to Martin Odegaard. I think the conditions were quite bad for a lot of it, but that was the same for both teams. But I thought the way Chelsea competed for 50-50s, they, the, it's, it's a very basic thing. But in some cases, when a game is that tight, it is about who... It sounds very Graham Souness, but who wants it more? Who who is is quicker to the ball? Who is more intense? Is it just more alert? I think Chelsea were just more alert in that game for a majority of it. And I thought a lot of that came from central midfield. I thought the way Chelsea's midfield three absolutely dominated and overran Arsenal's midfield three was a key part of the game and why it worked so well for Chelsea. Conor Gallagher was absolutely exceptional throughout. I thought um, the way Casado was able to eat up ground and win the ball back consistently. The way Chelsea were able to also press Arsenal in their own half and win the ball back high up. I mean, this is something we have seen consistently under Mauricio Pochettino. I think it was very evident against a, a very good opponent like Arsenal. And I think part of that was to do with the front three. It was to do with the midfield three, especially those who are pressing up. And also the the back four. I, I you know, you got specifically got to give credit to Marco Correa, who I thought done a brilliant job on Bukayo Saka for a lot of the game. Um, how aggressive Kukurea was against Saka, how um, touch tight he was. He, he was not allowing Saka any room to breathe. And sure, we can talk about, if you're an Arsenal fan, you talk about Saka's lack of fitness, how ready he was for this game, but you still got to play against him like he's 100% fit. And as we saw with the equaliser, he plays that brilliant ball in. Um, Saka is, is clearly a wonderful player. And I thought Kukurea, for everything that's gone Against him for all the criticism I've had and many Chelsea fans have had, I think we've got to give him credit. I I, I still will reiterate this. Kukurea playing well is good for Chelsea. It's not I, I don't understand people still if you're if you're unable to credit Mark Kukurea. I don't know what to say to you. I thought it was a really, really encouraging display from him. And it was the same with Malo Gusto, who looks like such a shrewd piece of business from Chelsea in terms of a backup, a competent backup to Reese James. But just a player who still is young, looks so able to compete at this level and also assist in the final third too. I thought from an attacking point of view, he was consistently looking to move forward to be able to break uh, through Arsenal's press when we could and, and get forward and assist and try and rotate with Raheem Sterling. It was really encouraging to see. So all round, there was just all round the pitch. I thought Thiago Silva, a player, I, I'll hold my hands up. I was wrong. I, I, I'll say it. I'll apologise to Thiago. I'll apologise to those who were, were doubtful of my criticism of doubting whether Thiago could still compete at this level. I mean, it's just extraordinary. At the age of 39, he is still competing at this level. I thought it was just brilliant to see how... You know, Jorginho, for instance, really struggled in that game. Um, you know, and Jorginho... I, I, side note, I did think the way both Kai Havertz and Jorginho were treated by sections of Stamford Bridge were a little bit weird to me. I, I didn't understand the booing. I wasn't part of it. Even my criticisms of both players, they were a part of a Champions League win. But you just saw in that first half the difference in what we have now. You know, Jorginho, we know how easily he can, he can be overrun. Gallagher just left him behind. Enzo did the same. And again... Declan Rice, an extraordinary midfielder. I thought actually, I know he scores the goal that changes the game, but actually if you look at the, the full performance, I thought he was nullified for most of it. I think he was bossed for most of it. And I think that was because of the midfield three we have. And I think it's really encouraging against this level of opposition to see such a balanced midfield go up against it and beat it for most of the time. Getting into some more individuals, and I'm more going to talk about the, the attack here. Cole Palmer obviously scores the opening goal. It's a penalty. And... I know John Terry was even tweeting this, right, in terms of it being unfair to defenders and in terms of the, the positioning. But it's a penalty because of the rules, consistency, and because earlier in the day, Michael Keane gets flagged up at Liverpool for a penalty. It's about consistency. If it if that isn't a penalty, then none of the penalties given for handball. And, and to be honest, I just think it is a handball. I think, sure, it's a little bit unfair on on. William Saliba in the sense that he's in that moment what are you supposed to do but then there also is the case that his arm is so up and it doesn't matter Arsenal fans if the ball was going wide this is the Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain argument from years ago when Eden Hazard's shot was seemingly going wide if your hand is in an unnatural position if it is blocking a shot towards goal to me it is a penalty Cole Palmer was lucky to stay on the pitch probably a lot of people pointed this out a challenge he made on Gabriel Jesus in the first half I hold my hands up and say Listen, if that's against a Chelsea player, I'm probably calling for it to be more than a yellow card. Uh, but Cole Palmer steps up, 
He scores the penalty and his uh, another massive moment for him as a player. And it was just, it was interesting to watch him because he wasn't just playing as a number nine. He was at times dropping as deep as even behind uh, Moises Casado and Enzo Fernandez. Like he at times was receiving the ball um, on the halfway line and turning. And it was brilliant to see how much trouble he gave to that Arsenal defence there. He's a talented player. And he looks like a real get for Chelsea. He really does. And this is another player we were sort of doubtful whether signing him and whether it was the right move. How would he settle at Chelsea? And you look at the bare numbers of what he's doing so far. He is an effective player for Chelsea Football Club. There's just no two ways about it. He has played, I think, four starts so far. He scored two goals. He's made three of them. A real talented player. He looks able to rotate with others. He looks able to play this central role and not be overawed by it. His pressing ability too is really dangerous. He gives opposing teams no room to breathe at times. And I think with the way him, Mudrik and Sterling worked as a front three, it's really encouraging against Arsenal. It really was, you know, against some really good defenders, against a defence who aren't usually overwhelmed like that and had just kept a clean sheet against Man City, one of the best attacks in world football before the international break. So Cole Palmer, I thought, really led that attack. But Raheem Sterling... And Mikhailo Mudrik. Uh, I, I just want to say Raheem Sterling. I mean, he just looks like a different player. On the left, on the right, the aggression, the way he absolutely bossed Zinchenko. Zinchenko didn't know what to do with him throughout the, the whole of the first half. And even in the second half, the way he turned and ran at Ben White consistently when he actually at, when he switched, I think he did in the second half, uh, following the substitution of Mikhailo Mudrik. Brilliant. It really is to see a player of that quality showing that quality now and showing that intensity i know people l last year against arsenal at home were talking about actually you know is raheem sterling going to be able to offer much to chelsea at this age he has proven under mauricio pochettino that there is still a lot to give for raheem sterling and, it, and i think that's absolutely true the quality within that player is undeniable and um to see both mudrick and sterling play so well in the same team is is really exciting Mikhailo mudrick um all-round brilliant performance I thought in the first half, from a defensive point of view, the way he was able to win fouls, the way he was able to win the ball back, track back, defensively look a lot more effective and just hardworking, which is what you need in these big games to, to, to get the ball, to win possession back, to win fouls, but also on the counter to be able to move so quickly and his decision making be a lot better too. And of course, the goal itself. I mean, again, it's just so heartbreaking that that moment, that celebration isn't part of a win but it still is a massive moment for him as a player because he is offering moments of inspiration he's clearly going like that as a player now and I think it's only going to get better for him and it's nice that we're seeing players like Mudrik have the bravery to do that does he mean it or not I mean Pochettino after the game said he was even trying it in training it's a difficult one to say did he mean it or not my initial reaction is it's a cross that just turns out to be a goal but if he meant it fair play who cares whether he meant it or not it's still a wonderful moment it's still one of the best goals you're going to see this season and for Mikhailo Mudrik against Arsenal ironically too there's a real talent there and the more trust he gets he's repaying that trust uh, from Pochettino by putting in effective and good performances so all round to see how productive that attack through Sterling through Palmer through Mudrik Jackson didn't have a good night off the bench but still this attack has improved under Pochettino. It's undeniable. And of course, Mudrik, I think, will continue to play. I'd be happy to see the same front three against Brentford next week. I know it's a different profile of team, but what do you think? I, I would like to see that. And I just want to say, I, I put up my man of the match poll, as I have been doing in recent weeks. And at the time of recording, 60% of you are voting for Cole Palmer as your man of the match. Second place is actually Marco Correa. We gave praise to Marco Correa earlier in the show. 10% uh, for Conor Gallagher and 10% for McCullough Mudrick. Not a lot of love for Raheem Sterling, but uh, Sterling has won man of the match in recent weeks, to be fair. So I think I've kind of covered the bases. The only the other player I want to give praise to is, uh, is Conor Gallagher. I thought just absolutely wonderful once again. I made this kind of what was deemed a hot take by 90 Min um, saying that I I would have Conor Gallagher over Matteo Kovacic every day of the week. I don't know how you argue with that opinion. Conor Gallagher is, I think he created most of the chances for Chelsea yesterday. 
He looks such so much of a mature player and rounded player this season. Again, against a top quality opposition, he proved to be so effective in winning the ball back, in harassing Arsenal, in being able to transition the ball quickly. And that's not to try and demean Moises Casado or Sterling or Mudrick or Palmer. I think all of them played well. But given I still see predicted lineups without Conor Gallagher starting, is nonsense. This is a guy who deserves to be in the Chelsea first team and that armband does not look to be burdening him. It looks like something that actually is is giving him more energy, which is just brilliant. So it's frustrating. There's no way. It's two, it's two points dropped. I think Chelsea could have also scored a third. There was the Palmer chance. There was Jacks. I, I'm more frustrated by the Jackson chance in, a, in the second half than I was by the, um, the Palmer chance, actually, which may seem a little bit strange because Palmer was so close to the goal. Uh, but still... Even at 2-0, we shouldn't be looking at those those chances. We still should be looking at the the inability of Sanchez to make a good decision and just completely shoot ourselves in the foot for what should have been a glorious evening at Stamford Bridge. Overall, I'm positive because I think the team is absolutely moving in the positive direction. You would have been more concerned if Chelsea got exposed last night, if Chelsea lost that game convincingly and actually any improvement we saw, if, if it would have been a last season type performance where people could have turned around and gone Chelsea were exposed that's not to say we won last night that's not to say there's no reason to be frustrated there absolutely is a reason to be frustrated but we competed we bettered Arsenal and I think that overall the team's going like that I really hope that the team can respond now and next weekend put Brentford to the sword and win that game convincingly and then go into another tough run against Spurs, against Man City with a lot of confidence. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below and I will see you again very soon. All the best.